<laughs> okay, stand up. Look at somebody and say, did you have cosmetic surgery? Did you look, you're looking better than you looked before. <laughs> okay, take your Bibles while you're standing up. And let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. We'll start reading there. Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father, and watch this. Here's what we're going to minister on this weekend. Your work of faith. Everybody say work of faith. Work of faith. And second, your labor of love. Everybody say labor of love. Labor of love. Labor of love and your steadfastness of hope. Everybody. Very good. Hope. Three things this weekend. Faith works. Hope. Love labors and hope endures. Faith works. Love labors and hope endures. He defines those three things. Let's pray tonight before we start. Father, we need you more than anything. We are helpless without you, but with you all things are possible. So tonight we just pray, Father, would you speak to us, challenge our hearts. Father, change us deep within the inside that we can change on the outside. We thank you for truth that sets free. Amen. And thank you for the word that delves deep within, beyond our, the mental faculties into the depth of our heart, that we can be changed, Lord, from the inside out. We thank you tonight. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Turn around and give somebody a high five before you say Would you give them a good high five? <laughs> okay, you can be seated. If I were to ask you how you're doing in your Christian walk, <laughs> if I were to ask you how you're doing in your Christian walk, well, how would you answer me? And, and what measure would you measure that by? How would you be able to say, I'm doing good, I'm not doing good, I'm, um, I'm okay, I'm not okay, I'm doing great, I'm not doing great. How would you measure, if I were to ask you, how are you doing in your Christian walk? Maybe you, maybe you gauge yourself by your prayer life or Bible reading or just numerous ways that you could do it. But let me tell you, one of the things I do in my life is there are three gauges I, I look at all the time. If you drive a car, you always look at the fuel gauge, you look at the temperature gauge, those gauges, and then hopefully you look at the, uh, how fast you're driving. <laughs> I didn't know that you're not supposed to be on the fast track, so we've been on the fast track lately. I understand you're supposed to have a, t a little something. I thought that was the carpool lane, but I understand that's not the carpool lane anymore. So there's gauges you always look at to see in your car. And in my life, there's been three main gauges that I look at quite a bit to know how I'm doing. And those three are faith, hope, and love. I always check myself as how am I doing on my faith, how am I doing on my hope, and how I'm doing on my love. And I gauge myself. And Paul, you know, in Corinthians 13 and verse 13 wrote, you know, now abides faith, hope, and love. But in 1 Thessalonians, he defines it a little bit further. And he talks about how each one of them functions in your life. And the way they function is that faith, it's an odd thing because there's always this fight between faith and works. And yet Paul links the two and says, we remember before God your work of faith. Everybody say work of faith again. Work of faith. Then he said we remembered your labor of love. Everybody say labor of love again. And then he said we remembered your steadfastness of hope. Everybody say that again. Stead, steadfastness. So hope, hope endures, love labors, and faith works. So one of the gauges I look at my life is uh, my work can either be dead works or it can be faith works. 
It can be works that are, that are Paul wrote and said, your, your work of faith. Because you need to work your faith. And, but I don't know if I'll get to that one this weekend. I trust you've probably been taught on that quite a bit. But the couple that I feel I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to take a couple on love and a couple on hope this weekend and encourage you. Because after tonight, I'm going to challenge you to do something this weekend uh, to prove how you're doing in the Lord. And so the first one I want to talk to is about love. Um, the word labor, labor of love, it, the word labor is karos in the, in the Greek. It meant not the labor of doing it, but, the, but uh, I wrote it out. It, it, mean, it emphasizes the pain and the weariness involved in the effort. It wasn't so much the work of it as the weariness and the pain involved in the effort. Love motivated them to work hard and serve even when they were weary. I remember one time a missionary went to a family. He'd come off the field and he told me, he was at, I was at a family and all this time this girl kept sewing. And I'd go by, we'd be with the family, but the daughter was over there. She was sewing and, I mean, morning, noon, and night. And he said after a week of that, I finally went to her and said, don't you ever get tired of sewing? And she said, no, it's my wedding dress. Come on, somebody. <laughs> How I many love, when love's the motivation, you do it, it's, it's a labor of love. And we call it that, sometimes when you do some things, I remember Mother Teresa, they, somebody told her, you know, you know the old saying, you know, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars, and she said, neither would I. Because what she did it for, she did it for love. And when love is a motivating factor of your life when you're working, it's totally different. Have you ever been out on the highway and saw someone that's a, a, a chain gang, someone from the prison having to pick up paper? You ever seen them? You ever seen them? They're not smile. You ever seen them smile? No. But if you go out on a highway that, say, a, a group has adopted that highway, you'll see them out there picking up the same kind of paper with totally different attitude and totally different heart. The whole difference is love and what's motivated it. One of the best ways to, to, to uh, talk about it, and I'm going to talk about it tonight, is the heart of a servant. And that's the difference. Because love it really is, is a servant. Because when you become a servant uh, to people, then what you do is you do out of a servant's heart and you do it because you love. In John chapter 13, I think I have my two bowls. Yeah. John, John chapter 13 is the story of two bowls. Everybody say two bowls. And John chapter 13, just to save time, I'll give you the scriptures and you can read them later because we, it would take a little bit of time. But the Bible says in John chapter 13 verses 1 through 5 and then 12 through 17. I'm not going to read them, I'm just going to tell it. The Bible says that Pilate uh, one time was given uh, the ability to, um, uh, to judge Jesus. They brought, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees brought Jesus because of envy. And the Bible says, and he was a, what we call an elected, elected official, a public what? Figure. Public servant. Y'all don't say it here. We call, we call him a public servant. And they're supposed to be a pub, they're supposed to be the servant of the public. Many of them are not because they don't do the duty. But, uh, but Pilate was a public servant. He was a, 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 an officer of Rome. And his charge was to literally bring out the laws and, and execute the laws. They brought Jesus to him, and the Bible says he found no fault in him. And he brought him out before the people, and he brought Barabbas, and he thought, here's how I work it. He said, which one do you want me to release? He used to do that every year, release one prisoner. Do you want me to release Barabbas or Jesus? And they all shouted Barabbas because the Pharisees had worked the people up. And, G and Pilate goes and says, but what about Jesus? And uh, they said, crucify him. The Bible says back and forth he worked and argued with them and brought him out again. His own wife sent word and said, I had a bad dream this night about it, if you read the scriptures, that about Jesus of Nazareth. Do not don't do anything to this uh, uh, innocent man. And the Bible says though he came to a place where Pilate uh, washed, it says he had ordered that water be brought to him. And the way that worked is that was they would fill a bowl up with water and they would bring it to the official. And this is where we get, I don't know if you've heard it being Armenian, but in English we have this term called, I wash my hands. I just wash my hands of it. And where it comes from was that day the way the Romans used to do it when they released themselves from any responsibility in the situation. They brought a bowl to Pilate, it says in, in John 13. Filled it with water. They brought water to him in a bowl. 
And he dips his hands in the water in ceremony and washes his hands of it. They bring him a towel. He dries his hand. He washes his hands of Jesus. What they literally did was he was, he was shirking his response. He knew Jesus was innocent. But because of the Jews and wanting to do them a favor, he washed his hands of it. That's what he used his bowl of water for. He washed his hands. Then in Matthew chapter 27, a little bit later, there's another story and uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most remarkable stories in the New Testament. It's a story of another bowl. And in that, in that, it was the story of the Last Supper, right before Jesus is arrested. And the Bible says they come to an upper room, that's a rented room, and the way it worked in that day was, you wore sandals and your feet got filthy. When you walked there, you know, you walked the same path that the donkeys and the horses walked. And here, and, and if you know anything about, if you ever walked one of those, they don't stop and the horse doesn't ask, can I go to the bathroom? He goes out on the side of the road, you know, and goes back. The horse just goes to the bathroom right where he is, right where you're walking. And when you're walking in that day, you walk through all of that. There's dirt, there's manure, there's uh, uh, this. You get to a home, that's why your feet were completely filthy. And every home had a servant, which was the lowest person in that house, and he would stand at the door with a bowl of water. He would wash your feet. That was the job of every lowly servant. And that night at the Last Supper, the Bible says that they rented a room, and it was a rented room, and it had no servant. And they all come into the room. And when you read it, it says, you can imagine, when they all came in the room, nobody washed anybody's feet. Everybody was uh, thinking about it. There was nobody, but there was a bowl of water. And the Bible says somewhere during that night, Jesus also took a bowl of water. But totally different than Pilate. The Bible says he took that bowl of water and knelt down. Come here, let me use you as an example. Can you, yeah, come on, you, I mean, you, are, you look good. Look here. Let me see. Right. Come, come on, come on. Okay, come on. Come on. He took him down, Jesus took him down, and he took all of their shoes off of them. Woo! No, he took, he t- <laughs> he took all their shoes off all the disciples. It was sandals in that day, but you understand shoes. And he put their feet in that bowl of water and he washed every one of their feet. Do you know what else it says? Stay with me just a second. It says when he got up, here's what he did. He took off his robe. It says he took a towel and he girded himself with a towel. This is like when you go to a restaurant, a servant, you know the waiter always has a towel around his... Where do you have your napkin? You have, because you, see, the waiter, the one that's going to wait on you, serve you, puts a towel here. But you, as the one that's going to be served, you do this, right? Because you're going to be served. It's not good for the mic, but you're you're waiting to be served. But the one that's going to serve you puts his right here. And the Bible says Jesus got up from the Last Supper and puts his towel around his waist, takes all the shoes off of everyone, takes up a bowl of water just like Pilate took up. And instead of shirking his responsibilities, he became a servant to every one of those disciples. Give him a good clap on him. Good thing. Thank you, buddy. Now watch this. When you see two basins, one of the things that happens is it has to do with either when you've got two basins of water, you're either going to accept your responsibility and serve one another or are you going to take the bowl of water as Pilate did and wash your hands of serving one another. You know God has called us to be servants of one another. He says serve one another in love. 
See, that's why love is a labor. Love is not a feeling. I feel, I feel so love. You don't feel love. Love is a labor. It's a labor of love. Love is action. Love is not something that's just felt. Love is not a song. You know, when kids fall in love, they have dyslexia. I mean, the birds fly backwards. Everything is it's just unbelievable. I tell them all the time. And what happens in life is, many times we don't understand what real love is because love is labor. Did you know, let me, you've got to read this because you won't believe it if, I, if you don't. If, chapter 22, you've got to read this one. Because the Last Supper, let me show you what was going on at the Last Supper. Jesus had taught them, and let me tell you why he got up and did what he did. Because here's what was going on at the Last Supper. Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Luke 22 and verse 19. bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave to them saying this is my body given for you. Am I in the right chapter? Yeah Luke. And he rem do this in remembrance. This is the cup poured out for you. It's a new covenant in your blood. He's, this is the last supper. This is so amazing truths. But behold the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. And they begin to question one another who it was in verse 23. Now look at verse 24. A dispute, a dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. <laughs> let, me, let me just say, while Jesus is giving the Last Supper, there's a dispute going on among them who which one of them was the greatest. Is it Peter? I'm the greatest, you know. He told me I was going to be a rock. Is it going to be John? He's going to tell me I'm going to be forever. One of them, there was an argument going on. Who was the greatest among them? Why did he get that position? Why did, why did those three get to be taken with him all the time? A dispute arose. Instead of, they did not get the idea of being a servant. Their dispute arose among them. Who was the greatest? And the Bible says when this dispute was going on, it's when Jesus got up, took his robe off, put a towel around his waist, and started washing the feet of all of his disciples to try to teach them what it meant to be a servant with a servant's heart. You know, one of the greatest things you'll ever do as a church is love each other to where you serve each other in love. To let a labor of love continue. The Bible says over and over again it happened. Jesus dealt with them in that day. And the Bible says they listened to him for a season and then they learned later on. But within minutes they were bickering over who was the greatest among them. You know, one of the things about life is this. Either you're going to this weekend, there'll be, well, this weekend and then really your life. All of your life you determine which bowl you pick up. You know, when you hear about something happening in the church or something happening to a brother or sister, you have a decision to make throughout your life about which bowl you're going to take up. Because many people, when they hear troubles going on in a person's life, somebody needs help, somebody... What they do is they take the bowl like Pilate does and they wash their hands of it. It's not my problem, not my responsibility. And they literally, instead of doing like Jesus did and taking up the bowl that he did, he didn't have to do that. But instead of being served, he said this one time, the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom. You know, one of the greatest guys in the New Testament I like is Andrew. There's a, one of the disciples was named Andrew, who was Peter's brother. And I don't know if you remember, but Peter, Andrew found Jesus, and the first thing Andrew did was he went and found Peter and brought Peter back to meet Jesus. One time he was, there was not enough food, and Andrew found a little boy with a little lunch, and the Bible says he went and got it, and literally... Um, uh, brought that little boy to Jesus. Another time these, these Gentiles wanted to see Jesus and the Bible says and they brought him to Andrew and Andrew dealt with it. One of the best things you'll ever do in your life is decide in your life that you're going to take the towel from around your neck, take it off, and become a servant. 